<laughs> All right. Do you have a Bible study guide? If you want one, grab one. If you don't have one, just steal from your neighbor. It's church. You can repent later. Uh, I don't have my what do you think I think about. We can do that in a minute. You can tell me what I think about, whatever. Uh, first Friday is this Friday, guys. So mid-school, high school at the house. Um, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Men's breakfast is not this Saturday. It's the next Saturday, right? So first Friday is the first Friday, but this Saturday is the first Saturday. So don't get confused. You can come, but I won't be here. Actually, I will be here cleaning, so come on. Uh, pray for each other. Pray for rain. Ah, if you'd like that. We don't have a kitchen. We have a cafe. It's a cooking area during the week. On Sunday, it's a cafe. A kitchen is where you leave brooms and towels on the sink. And we don't have one of those. Oh, yeah, we do have brooms. It's a cafe. <laughs> if you'd like to help with uh, in, in a cafe, we have, I'm not sure how many teams we have now, but uh, um, we're, we're forming a couple. We have three teams, complete teams, and we have four Sundays, sometimes five, right? So if you'd like to, to help out, uh, who's, so who's doing it now? Uh, Orlando and Marcella have a week. You have a week right now. Jeanette and Jessica, Judy and Becky have a week. So that's actually four. Oh, you don't count because you kind of fill in every place you have to. So Jerry doesn't count. How did I do, Cecilia? Jerry doesn't count. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so if you'd like to, to help us out and, and help to form a team, um, they can show you what to do, but let us know. Um, all right, what else is going on? We'll, we'll, we'll have a word of prayer now, and then uh, we'll dig in. Am I forgetting anything very, very important and scary? And are we all good? Are we yet amongst the living? All right. Father, thank you uh, for letting us come together. Thank you that we were born. Thank you, God, that we've been born again. Thank you, Lord, that you're still changing us and using us in your work. God, I pray that more and more, especially this group tonight, Lord, would would recognize the joy and the blessing of, of being involved in, in your ministry, being involved in your service. God, I pray that one by one, every single person who, who feels that this is their church home would recognize that, that joy, that honor, that privilege, uh, that this isn't, this isn't so much a place to, to come and consume as much as it is a place to come and cooperate, not just a place to, to, to come and watch, but a place to, to come and grow. So God, help us realize as we open your word uh, that you have a place for us to plug in. You have work for us to do. And God, I pray that we not lose sight of the fact that the work we're doing is not just stuff to do, but we're, we're providing an environment, providing a place, uh, providing a platform where, where people can hear the gospel and be uh, convicted of their sin, that they might repent of that sin, turn to you in faith, and be saved. God, use us to that end. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, what's going on in the world? What do I think about? Is anything anything newsworthy? I didn't even read the paper today. I'm not being spiritual. I just forgot it at home. The 19 firefighters in Arizona. That was horrible, wasn't it? Uh, it just, one survivor. One survivor. I think he was the spotter. Is that right? He was relocating the truck. and Yeah, that's, that's a horrible thing. Uh, I think we were talking just uh, was a week and a half ago. I said that in just a couple of weeks that about 100,000 acres uh, here in New Mexico had gone up. Now I hear that just one fire has consumed over 100,000 acres, and uh, it's, it's just become horrible. Another account that I read uh, said that New Mexico was the driest state in the Union. Not liquor, but uh, drought. Uh, no fireworks or just... You can purchase them, but you can't light them. Wow. That's the thing that on the news that you can't you can purchase them, but we, they will they will fall off the street. Yeah. Huh. Oh. They'll come and arrest you. They'll give you a citation. A citation. On social media. That's nothing. Five bucks. Next. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You don't. 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 If you're not supposed to, don't. 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 Um. <laughs> And it's not the 4th of July. It's Independence Day, right, Jerry? It's Independence Day. It happens to fall on the 4th of July. It's Independence Day. All right. Okay. Um, we're finishing up, I believe, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians was a short book, four chapters, but it's only taken me 20 weeks. I don't know how long I've been in, in Philippians, generally because I, I, I like to go back over, and by the time I go over my review, it's already 
time to end church, but uh, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, we've been looking at, uh, at, at four specific uh, privileges that we find or, or responsibilities uh, that, that God has for us through Philippians. And in chapter 4, we find that believers ought to have a life power. There should be a strength. There should be a, uh, an ability. Uh, we, we say, I say a lot, that when you got saved, you received a spiritual gift, a little birthday present from the Lord. That spiritual gift or gift cluster makes it possible a, 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 ton, of, a ton of blessing in all that. Uh, I mean, literally, it, it allows us to do a lot of things, your spiritual gifts. But I like to underscore three uh, aspects of your spiritual giftedness. First of all, your spiritual gift helps you see life the way God wants you to see life. Uh, we may look at the same situation and you see something that needs to be done, I'll totally overlook it. Uh, I, I get all worked up about something and, you, and I wonder, why don't you see what I see? Your spiritual giftedness helps you see life the way God wants you to see it. It not only gives you perspective, it gives you a passion for that. So that things that you see, I mean, it may be as, as, as simple as picking up a piece of paper or washing a fork in the cooking area. Uh, it, it could be it could be as mundane as uh, helping fix a, a sprinkler system, or, or or as grueling, depending on what time of the day, mowing the lawn out there, or or cleaning up, getting ready for for Sunday service. It could be helping get songs together, playing in the band, greeting somebody, uh, just kind of being a, a, a smiley face for a first timer. What, whatever whatever it is you're doing here, it ought to be for the Lord. Uh, I'm not telling you like that. I'm saying. It gets to be for God. It's not just a responsibility. It's a, it's a reasonable act of worship, Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 12. Your spiritual gift gives you spiritual perspective, so you see life the way God wants you to see it. It gives you a spiritual passion so that you get all worked up about the things God wants you to get worked up about. And you really want to do it. Oh, I want to. Oh, I do. I do. I do. I do want to do that thing, whatever it is. Perspective, passion, and then a power. And by the power, I mean you not only do this thing, but you do it successfully. You not only get involved in something, but it, but it turns out that you not only uh, get the job done, but it, it fits together in ministry. So that what's going on in the cooking area is every bit as important as what goes on in the band. And, and what goes on in mowing the lawn is just every bit as important as everything that I'm doing when I'm bringing a talk or when you're preparing the meals or when you're helping clean to get us set up. It's all working together. This is a partnership. Uh, and, and if we do it right, we're not just together like marbles in the same bag. We're together like masa in the same bowl. How do you say masa in English? We're dough, yeah? We're, I don't even know how to make tortillas. I buy them, they're grandmas. It's in the plastic and you open it, but I know how embarrassing, huh? What do you use, flour and water and all that other stuff that mom used to throw in that much, that much, yeah? When you mix it all together, it's not like marbles in a bag anymore, right? It, it's kind of hard to take them apart. You, you can't take them apart once they're mixed up. That's what church is supposed to be. So that when somebody's having a tough time, we all kind of feel burdened for them. When somebody's rejoicing, we all ought to, yay! That's what church is supposed to be. Most of us in churches, even in a church like this, no bigger than we are, a lot of times we, we don't know each other well enough. And sometimes that's by choice. You know, hi, how are you? Good to know you. And sometimes, hi, glad, glad to see you. Uh, don't sit by me, you know. Um, it's, you know, it, it's good to be a good judge of character, even in church. Can't trust everybody just because they're in church. I mean, there are snakes in church. I didn't mean me, but, you know, it could be anybody. You don't know, do you? Uh, we do judge a book by its cover. But really, we need to learn to judge according to this. Yeah? And sometimes we don't do a good job. Well, it's the same with ministry. It's, it's not just that way with men. It's not just that way with people where we misjudge. I think we totally misunderstand what ministry is. Ministry doesn't have to be some big old spiritual thing behind a pulpit with a three-piece suit. I mean, I don't do that. I'm not even wearing shoes. Ministry doesn't, what are you looking at? <laughs> She's looking to see if my, they're painted. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> ministry doesn't have to be big and special and <laughs> that sounded like a saw. That didn't sound like angels, huh? The saw with the... Uh, Ministry is what you do for God. It is. That's, that's what ministry is. Ministry is what you do for God. And if everything's working as it should, we partner together 
for that. So as we've been flying through over the last few weeks, the book of Philippians, we found in chapter one, believers ought to have a life purpose. And your life purpose ought to be to get saved. We say here, saved, soaked, and serious, right? I think in, in Philippians one, it was uh, saved and sanctified and serving, uh, if, if I recall. Uh, chapter two, believers ought to have not only a life purpose, but a life pattern. And, and to simplify it, look for people who are doing a better job in the Lord than you are. Not that you're doing a bad job, you're doing a great job. Just look for somebody who's doing an even better job in the Lord. If you're struggling in prayer, look for people who seem to be able to get a hold of God. That doesn't mean they learn how to rub the genie's lamp. And every time they say, they'll say, oh God, oh God, that, you know, blessings just fall down on their head. A lot of people have been taught that that's what prayer is. Effective prayer is getting goodies from God. That's not effective prayer. The main purpose of prayer, the main purpose of everything the Bible says is to glorify God. The main purpose of church, the main purpose of cafes, the main purpose of the band, the main purpose of teaching, the main purpose of brushing my teeth, the main purpose of wearing shoes or not wearing shoes, the main purpose of eating and drinking, Paul said in the book of Colossians, is to glorify God. Everything I do as a believer should, first of all, make God grin. You gotta make him happy. If you're making him unhappy, well, duh, right? It, it doesn't matter what a good husband I tell you I am. Don't look at her. Don't look at her. Don't look at her. Mm. How do you? <laughs> Thank you, babe. Good job. <laughs> Usually when she stands up, it means stop preaching. Yeah, but, uh, um, how's the best way to find out whether I'm doing a good job or not? Ask me. Probably not. Ask mama. Don't. I'm just theoretically. Yeah. I mean, who would, who would have a better idea, right? And so if there, theoretically, if there are areas to work on, who would know best? Well, probably someone close enough to the situation to, to, to be able to help a brother out, you know? And usually she just says, good job. Good job. Good job. Sometimes we need a, in the, you know, the elbow and the gut. Mm, hey. Yeah. It's kind of tough in church because most people think church is just for inspiration. Some people think, okay, inspiration, tell us a good story once in a while, but information. Just, just you know, teach us. And then leave us alone, stay out of my life. I don't need you meddling in my life. Just, you know, just tell me a good story once in a while and, and, and get a video that makes me cry and a couple that make me laugh. And so we feel inspired. And then you get a Bible teaching and hopefully he lets us out halfway on time so we get inspiration and information. But I mess everybody up because I believe that God wants not just inspiration and information, but transformation. What does that mean? Change. Change. Well, who the heck likes to be told change? Because that means you ain't doing it good enough, right? Uh, fix it, change it, do it different. <clears throat> but that's what I do. That's my job. How hard is it? First of all, to do that, how hard is it when y'all can tell, am I really in a position to do that? Some think, okay, maybe because the pastor has a position. But if you've been here long enough, then it's not just respect because of the position. There should be respect because of who I am as a person. And if I've blown it, then I lost all my poker chips. You don't know what that is. But, you know, <laughs> sinners, they play. And, they, and, and you get chips when you do good. You know, you, you, you know, you do something, you, you make somebody happy, you, you take care of somebody's kids, you, you pray with them in the hospital or something, you get, you get chips, you know, you get, and then you mess up, you say something stupid, you step on somebody's toes and you lose a few chips. If a pastor's not careful, he loses all of his chips and then that's it. Once the respect is gone, uh, as a person, it's just a matter of time before you lose respect for the guy as a pastor and by then you can't hear anything. It's, it's just the way it is. Um, it can be changed, but wow, what does it take to, you know, for the pastor to pull himself up by the bootstraps? That's not what it is, but often that's the way it feels. Once the guy has lost that position, then he can no longer say, follow me as I follow Christ. He can say it, but they're kind of empty words. Paul was able to say it, but there were a lot of people in Paul's day who when Paul said, follow me the same way I'm following Jesus, they said, who are you? little sawed off preacher who are you run because the bible the bible doesn't say the tradition says that paul was probably a short guy not a good looking guy uh kind of a mouthy guy i like that you know kind of a pushy guy yay a lot of people didn't like paul you you, you see that the people who liked paul didn't like him just because he had a great personality and a winning way and a charming smile they appreciated paul because they realized that god was using it was that a scary smile yeah 
they realized that God was using him and they wanted to be close to the guy who was close to God. That was transformation right there, wasn't it, my face? Yeah. In Paul's life, they could see transformation. He was killing Christians so that he became the super saint, huh? One that God was actually using. Find somebody who's doing a better job than you are. And you're doing a great job. Just find somebody who's doing a better job in their prayer life, in their, in their, in their walk with God, their behavior. You still have a problem with, with cussing? Find somebody who got over that. I mean, it's cool to find somebody who's never said a bad word in their life, but maybe better if you're having a bad word with a potty mouth, bad uh, time with a potty mouth, find somebody who couldn't control their tongue, and then now they can. What'd you do? Pray for me. Give, give me some tips. What do I do whenever I say a bad word? Well, tell Tony and let him chew you out. No. You know, you'd, you don't want it to be because you're going to get busted. You're going to get caught. Do you want it to be because inside you want to make God grin? Does that make sense? You fall in love with somebody, you want to you want to do what makes them happy. If I were a good husband, for pretense, if I were a good husband, I don't do the things that I do for Lauren to keep me from getting in trouble. If I'm a good husband, I do what I do because I want to make her happy, for pretense. <laughs> or I don't do the bad things because I don't want to make her sad. Right? So I'm not doing it because of the law. I'm doing it out of love. That's what ministry is. That, that's what the body is, the Apostle Paul said. So you, you want to have a life purpose. Make sure that you're saved. Make sure that you're sanctified, which is another way of saying that you're in that process of change. right? And make sure that you're serving. Second thing, make sure you have a life pattern. Find somebody who's doing a better job at Christian walk than you and, and hang out with them or talk to them or find out what they do and copy them. There's nothing wrong with that. And when you find somebody else who's doing a better job than they are, well, hang out with them. Copy them. I should be able to say, like, Paul, follow me. And, and, and I do, unashamedly. You're going to be disappointed in some areas of my life, but I think I'm doing a pretty decent job. But am I really the best one to be able to tell that? Probably you're in a better position to tell how I'm doing as you're looking through this. Does that make sense? Not just what you like, but what does God want? How's Tony doing, right? Okay, three, believers ought to have a life prospect. That means a pro Paul talked about reaching for that prize. There ought to be something you're reaching for. Uh, when you stand before the Lord, you will receive reward or lose reward. Ui, coco. Now, you don't stand, be if, you're, if, you've, if you've truly repented and given your life to Jesus Christ, you won't stand before the Lord to find out whether you get to stay or not. If you've repented of your sin, and you're truly born again. When you get in, you is in. You're in Christ. You can't get out. I don't believe in eternal security because I'm a Baptist. I believe in eternal security because that's what the Bible teaches. You can't get unsaved. Praise the Lord. You cannot get unsaved. If you're truly born again, you can't be unborn. My dad might decide, I wish he'd never been born. I might change my last name to Bonaguidi. I, I might go rob a bank, dishonor the Lord, uh, dishonor my, my father, my earthly father. I can, I can, I can do a hundred different things, but you can't change the fact that 58 years ago, Jake and Margaret Chavez had a bouncing baby boy. Thank you, Mom and Dad, if you're watching tonight. You can't, you can't change that. I could die, but you can't change that fact. I was born. You might mess up. Don't in the Lord. You might mess up. Don't in the Lord. You might mess up. Don't in the Lord. But even if you do, if you've truly repented of your sin and you've truly been born again, you can't change the fact that you've been born from above. You were born again. That's your guarantee. The Bible says that once you got saved, you not only got that spiritual birthday present, you received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's not tongues or, or some weird thing. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is your earnest. That's your down payment. Have you ever bought a cow or a horse or a house or a car and, and you didn't have everything for it, you put the down payment on it the bible says the holy spirit is the down payment of your eternal security that is your eternal inheritance and when you die you get it all because he already died to pay the price i don't know if that makes any sense your life prospect is you reaching for that reaching for that prize that prize he already guaranteed you're going to get it but when he finds you cooperating, you're praying for the things he already said that he wants you to have, you're reaching for the things he said he already wants you to get, then, ah, then you've got it. Then you've learned to live in Christ. 
Uh, it's not a mystical thing. It's not a, oh, I don't know how to live in the Lord. Yeah, you do. You do what you do because he says what he says. It's not any harder than that. So believers ought to, have a li ought to have a life purpose, ought to have a life pattern. Believers ought to have a life prospect. And then finally, believers ought to have a life power. This is strength to serve. This is power to participate. This is might to minister. How am I doing? Give me another letter. I'll try it again. Let's see what we have. God sent Israel to go into the promised land. This is after they've been redeemed out of uh, Egyptian bondage, right? Charlton Heston, take the guys out of Moses. And this is, and then Moses messed up. Moses didn't get to go in. He led them for 40 years. Moses messed up, didn't get to go into the promised land. And God told Joshua, dude, take over. Okay. And just before they went in, God said to Joshua, Joshua 1.6, be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Seven, be strong and very courageous. Be strong is kind of like this. This. Be strong. Courageous is kind of like that. Kind of like, like that. Strong is st firm. Strong. Here. Strong. Courageous is leaning forward. This is to stand. This is to serve. This is to stand. This is to go. This is to make sure that you don't lose it. This is to make sure that you get it. Be strong and courageous. Because it's not all defense. Defense, offense. Stand, go. There's a time for this. There's a time for this. There's a time for this. When you go, be strong and be courageous, Joshua, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them. Wait a minute. Isn't God going to give it to them? Yes. Were they supposed to go take it? Yes. So is it a gift? Yes. Are they supposed to go get it? Yes. Ah. Seven, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. So that you might be successful wherever you go. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Uh, did, I, did I already mention to you be strong and courageous? The Lord said to Joshua again. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Why would he say that? You think he'd be afraid? You think he was going to be discouraged? Ah, uh, yeah. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Whoever rebels against your word, verse 18, and does not obey it, whatever you command them, if they don't follow you, they will be put to death. Is that a promise to me, the pastor? No, it's to Joshua. But you, Joshua, even though I'm giving you this command, even though I'm giving you this promise, even though I'm giving you this authority, you, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Joshua said to them in verse 25 of chapter 10, Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Joshua said to them the same thing God told him, Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord is going to do to all the enemies that you're going to fight. There's a, there's a place for strength. There's a place for courage. And I'm telling you, because you, you, you're the special guys, okay? The good special. I hope more of the Sunday morning guys become more of you. Yeah, I don't just mean they come on Wednesday night. I mean they realize there's more, there's more to church than just punching in on Sunday morning. There's something, there's something about getting close to Jesus that if you really, I don't just mean you to get close to Jesus. I mean if you really, honest to Pete, you really get close to Jesus. He changes your life. You can't see things the same way. You, you can't rest just, oh yeah, I'm safe. Oh yeah, I go to church. When it really gets a hold of your heart, you may not know what's going on, but something's going on. I promise if nothing's going on, you better get saved. It's not enough that I prayed a prayer. I went forward in the church. And that's cool, but that, that's not it. If you didn't repent of your sin, if you didn't get saved, the Holy Spirit is not in you, and He's not moving in your life. He's not nudging you, gnawing at you, and convicting you. If you can do bad... And not feel bad. What? That's very bad. 
You need to be changing, so be strong and courageous because you are in a battle, Christian. You're in warfare. How many people in a church even like this, when I'm beating on you guys all the time telling you this, how many people in a church like this believe that, really, that we're in a battle, we're in warfare? They get all bent out of shape because I don't tell enough funny stories and make them feel good and pat them on the head or like that football player did to his lawyer, smack them on the behind, hey, good job. And I don't do that. But, you know, some, some equivalent to the holy high five and everybody feels good and church is over and next. This is a holy huddle. We get together and, and we kind of regroup and cheer each other on and we go out and we do the work of the Lord. Most have forgotten that. So Philippians chapter 4 Paul reminds us there's some stuff going on in your life and you really need to get a hold of it, okay? Four, four, four warning, eh, warnings, four reminders here. Uh, one of the reasons people in a church like this don't always do the ministry as well as we could, okay? One, we're weak in our walk, in our behavior, in our Christian walk. We're weak because we often fuss, James 4.1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Does that happen in church? No, no, not in church. It happens, doesn't it? Now, do two people who both think they're stupid and wrong do? No, don't they both think they're right and smart? Yeah. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come because you want stuff that you don't get? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill? That doesn't happen in church, does it? Well, it was only uh, three weeks ago, that uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I don't think it was that long ago that uh, somebody was shot in a, uh, a was it a funeral service at uh, New Beginnings? Yeah. Uh, Montgomery and Carlisle, I forget, what's the pastor's name? People think I'm him all the time. That one, Ron? No, Richard. I remember the first time I heard him on the radio, I thought, what, I what am I doing? He was speaking in Spanish. I didn't know what he was saying. He was preaching in Spanish. And then I saw him, I thought, Mansfield, Mexicano, Mansfield. Marilyn Mansfield. Was that somebody, Marilyn Mansfield? Marilyn Manson. I get my Marilyns confused. People are shot in church. Every once in a while you hear about deacons in Baptist churches uh, in, in Texas during counting committee meetings yeah, or, or counting the offering is one of the last ones I heard. Uh, they, they got into a big old fuss and a big old fight while they were counting the offerings and one guy pulled out a gun and wow. Things happen. People get angry. Uh, I, I think uh, in, in preparing for uh, you know, teaching, I, I, I read and I study a lot of deep, deep thinkers and, and theologians like Bart Simpson, I think it was. And, uh, he wants to buy a gun in this, I don't know where it was, I heard it. And, and they told Bart that there's a five-day waiting, something like that, to get his gun. And he says, oh, but I'm mad now. He says, yeah. Uh, are you raising your hand? Or, yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Oh, my goodness. Really? And a bullet had just been shot in the air? Shot in the air, and they ended up putting like, in the tree. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah that's why I don't go to church, because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, the guy who went crazy and went after the choir, that's why I don't have a choir. <laughs> You hear preachers go crazy? That's why you don't have a preacher. Uh, uh, but even in churches, people fuss. People get angry. Yeah, And God wants us to get over ourselves. He, he wants us to not think we're all that and realize both parties could be wrong, but both can't be right. You know, And we submit not one to the other. I mean, the, the Bible does say that, submit one to the other. But you can't really do that unless you're submitting to God. Does that make sense? I mean, you lay down your pistola first, and I'll lay down mine. Okay, you. One, two, three. Nobody's going to lay down their pistolas unless God's got control of the situation. Yeah? So we're weak in our walk sometimes because we fuss. You know, we've got it, and we can't turn it loose. You're not doing anybody any good. You're not making any points with God. All you're doing is just messing yourself up, so turn it loose. Sometimes uh, we're weak in our walk because we fret. Who uses that word? What does it mean to fret? To, to, to get all, huh? You, you think about it, but you get all anxious about it. You get all, this is the fret. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, 
yeah, yeah. Now, that, now, if I was the mama when that little baby was taken out, I, I don't think that's fretting, like, nervous anxiety. I think that's valid. You, you know, you, that, that's, there's a concern. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the kind of fretting that I'm talking about here is where Jesus said, don't be anxious about a bunch of stuff. Don't get all worked up about stuff that you can't do anything about. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, about your body or what you wear. Isn't your life more important than what you eat? And isn't your body more important than your clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't have to store food away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, fretting, add a single hour to your life? And the answer is no. Sometimes we're weak in our ministries because we fuss. Sometimes we're weak in our ministries because we worry about stuff. We fret. Sometimes we're weak in our ministries because we fail. We mess up. Ephesians 4.1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Paul wrote this while he was a prisoner. He said, look, this is who you were, sinners. This is who you are, a saint. Why do you live like you're down here? Live like you're up here. Live according to the calling to which you've been called. Huh? A little redundant over and over again. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you then to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Sometimes our ministries kind of flounder because we fuss, we fret, we fail. Sometimes because we flail. What does it mean to flail? Um, like a swimmer who gets tired and can't anymore, or somebody who can't swim and gets close to the middle of the pool, and you see the arms thrashing and they're not getting anywhere. Yeah, uh, flailing is 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 is, is, is you, you can't you can't get anywhere, but you can't stop trying. You can't stop moving. Most churches are there. Ah, I can't even say most churches are there. Most churches, I believe, aren't even trying to serve God. Most churches aren't even trying. They, they, they like it. I don't know why they get together to tell you the truth. Second Corinthians 8, 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their own ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Now Paul is talking about a group of people who, who financially, they gave financially to his ministry. The, 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 the cool thing is not that they gave to his ministry. Paul didn't want to be a burden on anybody, so he was a tent maker, right? I mean, that's a phrase now. That I guess technically I'm a tent maker because you don't pay me a salary and because our financial blessings come from outside the church, uh, I guess technically I fall into that category, right? Um, Paul literally cut leather and sewed leather together to make literal tents that's how he made his money because he didn't want to be a burden on any of the churches i don't want to be a burden on you but paul also went out of his way to say you know it's really best for you guys to support me because it helps you understand your fiscal financial responsibility before the lord to take care of those and honor those who are laboring among you now I, we lauren and i have decided i we don't want to be a burden to you but Paul said, I'm grateful to this church, this particular church, who gave to him, not because they gave to him, but because they gave out of their deep poverty. They gave what they didn't have to give. First they gave to the Lord, then they gave of themselves, not their money. They gave their heart. Churches that flail are trying to do things in their own strength. What is it? Is it Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your, your own understanding. Uh, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Uh, what's the rest? He'll direct your path, give you a healthy belly button, I think. Some, bring health to your navel or something like that. The King James. Um, when churches flail, that's assuming they're even trying, but they're not getting anywhere. Usually it's because they think they lack resources. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough help. We don't have enough men. We don't have enough women. We don't have enough this. We don't have enough that. When we flail, when we fail, when we fret, when we fuss, our ministries are going to be weak and ineffective. All right? We, we want to be beyond that. So 
the kind of uh, power that I'm talking about now gets us beyond all this stuff. The kind of power that will keep us strong in service for the Lord is found in the peace that isn't dependent on your rights. Well, it's my right to... Eh. There's a peace that isn't dependent on you getting your way. There's a prayer that isn't dependent upon what you've been taught in your church. There's a purity that isn't dependent upon your righteousness. There's a prosperity that isn't dependent on your resources, what you have or what you don't have. Let's look at those quickly. That's, that's what I saw, uh, find in uh, Philippians chapter 4. First of all, that peace that isn't dependent on your rights. Philippians 4.1. Paul writes, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord. In this way, dear friends, I beg Odious and soon touchy, Judea uh, and Syntyche, I plead with Judea and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse 3, yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they contended at my side. They were, they were working with me in the gospel. They were serving side by side with me along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Always in, I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Well, evidently in the church at Philippi, there were two ladies who were, or maybe they were, I don't know how bad it was, but they were fellow laborers with Paul. They were serving God. They were involved in the ministry. They were doing for God. They were making God grin. And now they were embarrassing everybody, these two women. Get over yourself already. Okay, you were mad. Quit being mad. Okay, you were angry. It's over. It's over. Why do you take out your anger and mm, nice anger? Then you put it back in your heart. And then every once in a while, is that anger still there? Ooh, nice anger. <laughs> nice anger. And you put, take it out and kill it. Kill that anger. Who's it helping? Who's it hurting? It's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an acid in your soul. It's corrosive. And the person you're mad at, they don't even know. They don't even care. It doesn't even bother them anymore. And you're losing sleep over, oh, I hate him. E what she's doing to me. Oh, if she does that to me again, I will tear her tongue right out of her, right from the roots in church. I'll, <laughs> we would never think like that. But evidently, but evidently, these two ladies in the church, it was enough that the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, tell those two women to get it together. What are they accomplishing? Now, this is the interesting part to me. Go back, to, go back a slide, guys. Read with me. Therefore, my, you don't have to read it out loud, but check this out. I underlined them just to make it easy to find. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for my joy and crown, stand firm. What? in the Lord. In this way, dear friends, I plead with Judea and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Uh, next one. Good. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord. Don't overlook that. You're fighting. Two people are fighting. Two people are angry. Maybe justifiably. Maybe you really got wrong. Maybe they really did you a job. Maybe they really messed up. Man, I would never say, well, just eh, forgive and forget. I forget nothing. I'll shoot him. Uh, no, you're right. <laughs> Forgiving somebody in the Lord, and again, I don't know that you need to forgive if they don't repent. It's right to have a forgiving attitude and a forgiving spirit, but if they don't repent, you don't need to forgive. Be, I, I'm not saying be hard. It's great to have a forgiving attitude. But even if you do forgive, I understand that forgive and forget thing. I don't know that that's in the Bible. I mean, if Uncle Peefy likes to touch the little kids, you might want to forgive him, but I wouldn't leave him alone with the kids. You know what I mean? If someone has demonstrated stupidity or worse, spiritual <laughs> depravity, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't know. I just when I drink, I just. <laughs> All right, I forgive you, Uncle Porfirio. Do it again. I'll break your face in the Lord. You know, I don't know. Okay, that's a little extreme. Forgiving somebody is not the same as being stupid and just ignoring. If they truly repented, that means they're truly changed. 
It doesn't just mean, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Those are easy words, aren't they? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. So, you've got a beef against somebody. That put, put down your pistolas, I put down my pistolas. Yeah. Okay, you be nice, I'll be nice. Mm. This is how it works. I don't think it's compromise. I think it's total surrender. Not to each other. The Bible says submit one to another. But first you submit to the Lord. So it looks like this. There's the Lord. Here's me. Here's Lauren. I hate her. Ugh, she's awful. I almost said I hate her. I don't hate you. <laughs> this is so absurd. So I thought this is a good one, babe. Here's Lauren. Here's me. We've got a beef. Not for real. Now, she's supposed to just submit to her husband, right? Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I, the husbands love that passage, sub, wives submit. But the passage before that says submit one to the other. And I don't like that one. And I, and I like that it says wives submit to your husbands, and it just says husbands only have to love their wives. That one's easy. You know, it says love your wife as Christ loved the church, a la modi. So then husbands say, I will take a bullet for my baby. I would jump in front of a train for her. And back in the days when I was spiritual and used to do marital counseling, premarital counseling, I don't even do that anymore. But back in the days when I did, I would ask questions like, listen, the question is not, are you willing to take a bullet for your wife? Are you willing to pick up your socks for your wife? Are you willing to wash dishes for your wife? Are you willing to rub her feet? I don't know what, but you know what I mean? It's not just a matter of being willing to die. It's a matter of being willing to live for Christ loving the church, he gave how much? Uh, 30%, 35, uh, 60%. A good marriage is 50-50. That's not what the Bible says. It's 100%, 100%. Yeah, but what if I'm not getting my 100%? So how does that work practically? My answer is I don't know. You know me. I'm not very spiritual. I don't think it's you got to figure out how to make it work this way. This says... Keep figuring out how to make it work this way. Because the closer she gets to Jesus and the closer I get to Jesus, guess what, guess what happens to her and to me? We get closer together in the Lord. You're rejoicing because you ignore the situation? No, you're able to rejoice in the Lord. You're able to live in the Lord. You're moving this way. And as you and I are moving this way, what happens? We get closer together. As a husband is trying to serve God, as a wife is trying to serve God, I mean, this is ideal. This is another reason I don't generally marry people. Most people who want to get married, I'm talking generally, most people who want to get married, they totally don't understand that that's what marriage is. Marriage is totally surrendering to Jesus Christ. It's not him and her, and oh yeah, in church is nice. No, it's I totally want to live for Jesus Christ. It's her saying, I totally want to live for Jesus Christ. I'm not saying the people who have asked me didn't want to do that. I'm just saying, I kind of set up policy, I'll make exceptions. I will. Maybe. But it's got to be huge. It's got to be so clear to everybody. He wants to serve God so bad. She wants to serve Jesus so bad. And Paul said, look, if, if, if you have the gift of remaining single, you stay single. This is not just me saying, you know, this is not the guy trapped in a bad marriage. Don't get married. That's not me saying that. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm ha no, I am. I'm happy. I am. I'm the happiest husband I know. I really am. I really am. I really. I know. Uh, no, I am. I am. I am. <laughs> and this is from a happy husband position. I even forgot what I was going to say. Now, I, you think I was making up a lie? Stay single. Oh yeah. <laughs> Stay single. Stay single. That's what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 and 8, and the whole rest of it too, stay single. Now, if you're just so preoccupied, and, and God knows how he wired us. Guys like girls, girls like guys. And if guys like guys, that's not the way he wired you. Well, I can't help it. I was born in... Nah. That's a whole other sermon. God, God knows he wired guys to like girls and girls to like guys. If you are so preoccupied with that, well, you need to get a life, first of all. But understand that if, 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 if you just don't have the gift of singleness and you just want to be married, okay, God says to the Apostle Paul. I get that. But understand this. The whole point of remaining single is not just to be single like a monk. 
The whole point of being single is so that you can be single-hearted. So that you're focused on following Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't have the gift of remaining single, fine. But dude, if you just want to serve God with all your heart, if marrying her is going to make you stronger, go for it. She just wants to serve God with all of her heart. And marrying him is going to make her stronger. You go, girl. But what usually happens? If you're smart, you marry somebody who's more spiritual than you. I mean, of course, marry somebody better looking. But you know what I mean. You marry somebody who's in better spiritual condition. Well, if they're smart, well, why would they marry you? Serio, really? Why? You should marry someone who's more spiritually sensitive than you are. Usually what happens, and, and this is what the Bible says, what, what is it, good friends, bad friends, corrupt? How does that go back? That one, amen. Yeah. Usually what happens is one is a little more spiritual than the other, and this is why God says if one is, is a believer and the other is not, uh, it's not a Catholic, Baptist, Jehovah's Witness, well, Jehovah's Witness, that's a whole other thing, I guess, but it, it's not a where you go to church or you, that you don't go to church. It's one is totally wanting to follow Jesus Christ, the other is totally not wanting to follow Jesus Christ. Guess what's going to happen? Is this one going to pull up this one? Rarely. Generally, this one pulls down this one. Now, if this is going to happen, do it before you say, I do. But then again, careful. Now, this is not just a preacher. I'm telling you, that's what God says. The name of the game is serving Jesus Christ first. If getting together is going to make you stronger, go. If getting together is going to make you stronger, go. If getting together is going to make you weaker, don't. Go the other way. Go the other way. In the Lord. In the Lord. Go back again to the slide before. Therefore, brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. I plead with Judea and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. It doesn't just mean, see it my way, see it my way. That's why we fuss. See it my way. No, you see it my way. No, you see it my way. No, you see it my way. Eh, see it his way. That's what it means to be of the same mind in the Lord. So you, you're taking on his mind, the mind of Christ, Paul said in Philippians 2. All right, so you get the idea. Uh, it's time to go home. Not really. <laughs> There's a peace that transcends your personal rights. So, first principle, true power for life doesn't come from reaching for what you deserve. I mean, I want you happy. I want you to have a happy life. And I deserve it. You deserve it. I mean, I'm American. And, and I'm guaranteed the right to, pers to the pursuit of happiness, right? Well, that, that's being in America. But being in the Lord means not reaching for what I deserve, but for reaching what God, for what God demands. Does that make sense? I should be reaching for the stuff God wants me to have, not reaching for the stuff that I just want to have. Now, as you become closer to God, as you live more in the Lord, guess what? You're going to start reaching for more and more of the stuff that you want. It's going to be more and more of the stuff He wants. And it's not going to seem all big and spiritual. You're just going to love what He loves and hate what He hates. If that makes sense. So, first uh, principle there, there's a, a peace that uh, isn't dependent on you getting your rights, too. There's a prayer that isn't dependent on what you were taught in church. Uh, some of us, come, a lot of us have Catholic backgrounds. Uh, a lot of us have charismatic Pentecostal backgrounds. We were all taught certain things in church about prayer. We want to get over that. We want to get beyond ourselves so that I'm not praying Baptist prayers. Y'all aren't praying Catholic prayers. Y'all aren't praying charismatic Pentecostal prayers. You're learning how to reach for the things that God wants you to reach for. So, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, go to God in prayer. Go ahead and ask for things. Prayer is just kind of hanging out with God. Petition is when you ask Him for things. Thanksgiving, yeah. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, that peace that passes understanding. Um, uh, just a quick, uh, we talked about ACTS, A-C-T-S, A-C-T-S, ACTS. When you pray, this is not a bad way to go about it. You start with adoration. Lord, you're awesome. Sometimes just to force myself, I'll, I'll kind of make up a prayer doing ABCs. Uh, God, you are A. Awesome. That's spiritual, huh? I, I don't say things like, God, you're adorable, because I don't know. But uh, awesome. Almighty. God, you are, what's the next letter? B. 
God, you are uh, beautiful. You are bountiful. You have a lot of stuff. God, you are... I ran out of bees. Let's go to see. God, you are... God, you get the idea? God, you're creator. God, you are the Christ. God, you are compassionate. Amen. D, God, you are dependable. God, you are divine. E, God, you are amazing. I know it doesn't start with E, but sometimes you just you just kind of kind of kind of not force yourself, but but you just kind of take it outside of the normal, and just what, what would you like to hear? You know, it's nice when people say nice things to you. What would you like to hear? And don't, don't flatter him. That's when you say nice things to people because you're trying to get stuff from them. Then don't flatter him. I, I think he'll see through it. I'm not sure, but God might see through that. You're not flattering him. You're just telling him that you love him. Yeah, you, I love you, Lord. And what did he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I say. Yeah. So, A, C, T, S, A, adoration. C, confession. And I, do you think when you confess your sins, he goes, wait, 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 go back to, what did you do? You think he's surprised by anything you say? The word confession means to speak the same thing alongside of. When you're confessing your sin, you're not letting him in on some big dark secret of your heart. You're just saying the same thing about that action that he says about it. It's despicable, it's wicked, and it deserves hell, huh? <laughs> yeah. And you recognize that it wasn't just a weakness. It's wickedness. It's not just a shortcoming. It's sin. You know what I mean? <laughs> so when you say the same thing about that fib that he says about it, you say, oh, I had to. I was going to get in trouble. He says, no, it was a lie from the pit. And you go, oh, yeah. So confessing, so you don't have to go through the laundry list. Maybe not bad, but the point of it is to recognize you need Jesus Christ. You need him to forgive you. You need him to save you. You need him to change you. A, adoration. C, confession. T, thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Shoot, go down the laundry list there. That's okay. God, thank you for the thank you that I ate today. A lot. Of, a lot. <laughs> thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that I could eat today. Have you ever been so sick you couldn't eat? No. <laughs> Never been there. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. Man, have you, ever been, have you ever been so messed up that you just, man, you couldn't think straight? Uh, last week I went through a headaches, headaches. I don't get migraines. I don't think they were migraines. I'm just a baby. But, man, they, they were way this side of debilitating, but they were close enough that, ah, you know, you try to sleep the afternoon away, and then the next day I tried to eat it away, and then the next week I tried to, not, uh, not next week, but uh, thank you, God. That I don't have a headache right now. I'm a little sore, but I don't have that headache. Uh, thank you, God, that I'm, I, I think I'm clothed and in my right mind. I think. I could be someplace else, but I think I'm here and I think I'm okay. <laughs> there might be a time that I might be washing my hands or something else in the hallway of some nursing home, and I think I'm here preaching. And, you know, I hope if you know me, you'll take care of me and say, oh, let's, let's go back to the room, Tony. <laughs> but thank you, God, that right now I, I kind of am okay, you know? Man, there's a ton to thank him for. Thank you for my kids. Even the bad ones. Thank you, God. <laughs> and S, supplication. That's where you bring your goodie list. That's where you bring your request list. But it's a good order. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and prayer. Again, pray however you want. One of my favorite heretics, Larry Lee, pastored a church in Rockwall, Texas. And I, he got my attention because he was a Southern Baptist preacher. He was preaching in a, in a town of, I don't know, uh, 600 people, something like that. He had 11,000 people in his church. And so I used to watch it. But one of the things that Larry used to preach on all the time was prayer. And he used to talk about uh, going through the Our Father. And not just to recite the bata, 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 not the repetition of words, but Our Father. God, you are my Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Ah, oh, Lord, you're the Holy One. You're my Heavenly Father. Thank you for my dad, but thank you that you are my Heavenly Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, God. 
you are the awesome one. You're the beautiful one. You're the Christ. You're, you're Jehovah Rapha. What is that? The, the Lord who heals. You're Jehovah Sidkinu. What is that? The Lord who provides. You're, you're, you're Jehovah. You're the I am. And, and he would just go through all the names he could remember. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Oh, God, I wish I really wanted your kingdom here as much as I want my kingdom here. God, I'm just praying that you'd get me through the day and that you'd bless me with a little more money at the end of the week. And God, I wish I could pray that your will would be done in my life. Thy kingdom come and Lord, thy will be done in my life just like it is in heaven. Wow, who can pray that? I mean, God tells the angels jump. They don't even ask how high. He tells me to jump. I go, oh, are you talking to me? Thy will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. God, thank you for whatever I'm going to eat today. Thank you for whatever you're going to do with that food. Thank you, God, for what you're doing with this body. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in my life. Give us a stare daily breath. Forgive us our trespasses. Lord, I am so unworthy. And you just come to God and just talk to him. And sometimes it's okay to have a little help. So Larry Lee used to teach us, used to teach us, his disciples, used to teach people who are listening, you kind of run that track of our Father, and you just kind of go through it, and, and you just stop, and you spend time with the Lord, and you find that you end up praying for about an hour, hour and a half. Who could pray that long? I barely get like 30 seconds, and I, was that me? <laughs> who was snoring in the middle of my prayer? <laughs> Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Second principle, then, the true power for life doesn't come from saving or saying what you've been taught, but asking for what God wants. Most of us have been taught in churches to figure out that effective prayer is getting from God. No, effective prayer is getting with God. And whatever he gives, bonus. Yay! But most of us don't get that. You probably do, but most people in churches like this don't get that. Three, purity. The power for serving comes from a purity that isn't dependent on your own righteousness. How good are you? It doesn't matter. You need to be godly. You need to be sinless. You need to be righteous. Who can be that? Good question. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. What music do you listen to? When I'm driving around, I listen to KOB uh, talk radio, which is everything opposite of this. Yeah, like reading the newspaper, like listening to the news all day long. I listen to Fox News. I watch Fox News. Again, probably totally the opposite. When I listen to the radio, I listen to Christian, you know, like the, the message or... Uh, uh, K-Love, uh, uh, I listen to 60s music and 70s music because I'm kind of stuck there. Yeah. I'm still wearing bell bottoms. I don't know if I am for real, but in my mind, I'm still cutting my pants and sewing the material. and I'm still wearing a headband in my mind, on my leg and my head. I'm stuck in the 70s. Uh, is it okay to like music? Is it okay to, oh, sure it is. But if the lyrics to that song are not lifting me in the Lord? Do I have any business putting that in my head? I mean, if, if you find Tootsie Rolls in the back or Hershey's Kisses, when you walk out, that's cool. But if you find one that somebody put in their mouth, and, oh, I don't know, it was chocolate, and then you leave it on the floor, it's still a Hershey's Kiss, right? <laughs> you don't have to put everything in your mouth. And you don't have to let everything go into your head or your heart. You have control of that dial. Yeah, but I like the way it sounds. Yeah. Careful. Careful, 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 careful. Did I miss anybody? Careful, careful, careful. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Yeah, don't let everything come into your head because it's going to get into your heart. So just be careful. If there's anything praiseworthy, Lauren and I like to do it. Shh, a secret. On Mondays, when I can, I like to sneak away and go to the movies. Shh, shh. <laughs> and we talk about that because... I, as far as I'm concerned, that kind of fits in there with other activities. That I was The church I got saved in, you shouldn't go to movies. The Bible college I went to, you're not supposed to go to movies. Should I be careful what movies I go to? I should only go to G's, Walt Disney? Walt Disney movies are full of sorcery, <laughs> witchcraft. It's not just imagination, it's bad. So I just go to ours. No, 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 no. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I don't. I, we don't. We don't. We don't. Um, some Christian movies have been forced with an R rating because in this culture, they're saying, ah, you got to be careful what you put in your little kids' minds. But it's okay to let kids listen to palabras así, big, awful words like that because it's art. It's in a movie. Or to see kinds of things. Well, it's, it's, that's life. Ah, you got to be careful. So Lauren and I were talking about as we were walking out. What did we say? Uh, never mind. I don't know what we saw last week. Here. Oh, just thank you very much for telling everybody. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I thought it was a Christian movie. White House. Huh? But we, we do White House down. We like to look for movies that, I mean, I don't look for it. I think this will be inspiring. I think this will be. But we just, but we really do. We kind of, we, we appreciate movies where you find people who are self-sacrificing. People who start out like jerks. I love Iron Man, the first one. They get darker. Is it? The first one, Iron Man, he's a total jerk. Tony Stark, I love him. The bad one, not the good one. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. And then you, you kind of see this transition. You kind of see him moving from self-centered jerk to the place where he's willing to give up everything because it's right. Yeah, yeah. Rocky, when I'm so depressed, when, I, when no amount of medication can get me out of my blue funk. Adrian! <laughs> I'm ready to go again. I'm ready to go again. Yeah. Rockies, uh, Star Treks, old Star Treks. Uh, you know, you, you, if you're not in the captain's chair, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do all the things that you might be able to do. I, I, it's kind of silly. It, you know, there's not like that lays down over life. But we really do. I, 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 like, I like movies. I like watching TV. I, I like movies. But we really do. We look for things that are halfway inspiring. It's hard to find anything anymore without bad words and you know, a scene here and there, but if you can find anything admirable, anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, think about those things, okay? Three, uh, what was that last question? The true power for life doesn't come from being good, but from, from being godly. So it's not enough to just be good. You really want to be godly. Okay, our time is gone. We're going to fly. You ready? Four, prosperity. The power for ministry comes from a prosperity that has nothing to do with how much money you have in your wallet. It has nothing to do with your resources. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me, Paul says. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Look, I know what it is to not have enough money. I know what it is to have all the money I need. I know what it is to be content in every way. The secret of being content in every situation. If I'm well fed or if I'm totally not finding anything to eat whether I'm living with all I need and more or have nothing here's the passage that we're familiar with I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me uh, I read of a, a, a cheerleading squad in Texas uh, who, who sued because they weren't allowed to put uh, Bible verses on their cheerleading signs you know when the football team comes out and the paper sign and the football team is strong enough they could tear through the paper and they could and they were told that it's, you know, separation of church and state, they couldn't have Bible verses, they sued, and I think six months later, a judge ruled, <coughs> yes, you can have Bible verses on your football signs. And one of the verses that they talked about, the kids always having, was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is a verse that they throw out there, like, you know, supposedly to inspire the football team, you can win the game. Is that what this verse means? No. I mean, I think it's cool that they want to put that up there. That's not what this verse means. Really? Can you do anything you want to do through Christ? No. Remember that in the Lord? If he wants you to do it, yeah, you can do it. If he doesn't want you to do it, you're not going to do it. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter your resources. If he wants you to accomplish something, it doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you don't have. You want to keep moving closer and closer to him. Don't be overwhelmed by your situation. Don't be overwhelmed by your circumstances. It's easy for me to say, but he says, don't be overwhelmed. Don't be overly anxious. God's not saying don't, don't be concerned about it. He's saying don't be so worried about it that you, it just debilitates you. It just keeps you stopped. Satan can't stop you. Satan cannot stop you. But life can throw up enough depression, disillusionment, discouragement, distractions. Who decides to stop serving the Lord? You do. 
He doesn't stop you. You decide to stop. You get so mad. You get so angry. You get so frustrated. Get over yourself and just serve God, he says. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you don't have. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. That all things through him is not just he's going to put his power in my gloves. Eh. That's another in him passage. I can do all things when I'm in him. He's the one who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me the matter of giving. No one gave me any money. I had to eat. I had to live, Paul says. You were the only ones who helped me. 16, even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me financial aid more than once when I was in need. It's not that I desire your gifts. Man, it's not about the money, Paul says. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Listen, God was so happy when you guys did that. I have received full payment, and I have money more than enough. I'm fine. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable uh, sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. There it is again, in Christ Jesus. He doesn't have to give you everything you want or everything you think you need, but as you're getting closer to him, you find that he's going to provide everything you need for whatever it is he wants you to do. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. By the way, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. A lot of people in Caesar's household got saved. <coughs> to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. True power for life doesn't come from what you have. True power for ministry comes from what he has. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're not limited. So I said we're weak in our service often because we fret, we fuss, we fail, we flail. The kind of power that will keep us strong in service. That, that, that assumes that you want to serve the Lord. If you don't want to be involved in ministry, well, I just wasted an hour of your time, an hour and ten minutes, actually. If you really don't want to serve the Lord, this is just more information. It wasn't even much inspiration. It was just blah, 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 right? He's voting. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know what I mean? You don't need more information. You need transformation. That's what he says. That's not just me saying you're not, you're not all that. He's saying you're not there yet. I'm not there yet. If the information transforms you, then good. What did Paul say in Romans 12? I beg you, brothers, I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, no longer be uh, 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 conformed to this world, right? But rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As this gets in you, it changes your shape. So power for service, assuming you want to serve the Lord, power for that service, that strength in service is found in a peace that isn't dependent on you getting your way, a prayer that isn't dependent on how you were taught in your Catholic charismatic Baptist church, Purity that isn't dependent on your own righteousness because you ain't good enough. Good enough isn't good enough. God wants you to be godly. And a prosperity that isn't dependent on your resources. It's dependent on His. That's right. God, help us. Help us love you. Help us live for you. Help us lean in your direction, God. Help us be strong when we stand. Help us be courageous as we go. God, help us live for you. God, I pray that every single person who can... Hear me, God, every single person who's been watching online, God, every single person who's here in this building, God, I pray every single one of us might, might leave this place tonight, this, this time of, of getting together with a stronger desire to live a life that makes you happy. God, help us serve you. Help us come closer and closer and closer to you with every decision we make. God, surround us with people who love you more than we love you. God, give them mercy and grace that they might condescend to men of low estate to, uh, with us. God, they might hang out with us, that we might become more godly, more spiritually sensitive like they are. God, surround us with people who love you so much and inspire us to love you that much. God, we want to serve you. Help us want to serve you more. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.